we talk about Chapter 8, Production of Steel by Casting, Forging, Extrusion, and Powder Metallurgy. Casting is one of the oldest ways of producing metals into useful shapes. So casting steel is going to be a little bit different than casting iron in that it just doesn't cast as well. Cast iron has ingredients that make it flow better into molds. However, after it's cooled down and made into a useful shape, cast iron is typically very brittle and only useful for certain things. Cast steel, after it's cast, is going to be stronger and have better properties. So typically better toughness, which is impact resistance, and more ductility, which just means it can stretch a little bit before it breaks. So the whole casting process is pretty simple. You melt steel in a, a big crucible. You pour it into a mold made of sand or some other material into a mold cavity. So the mold cavity and whatever material uh, the mold is made out of is the shape of the part you're looking for. The mold cavity is produced by use of something called a pattern, which is just a, a solid thing that looks just like the part you want, made out of some dinky material like wood or styrofoam or even aluminum. It's just there to create an impression in the mold so that there's a void for the molten metal to go into. So for something like sand casting, it's like a reverse sand castle. You take your pattern, which is just looks like the part you want, made out of wood or aluminum or something, you press it into the sand, it's gonna make an impression, you pull the pattern out, and you're good to pour the molten metal in, you'll have the shape of the part you want. One thing about patterns is because metal expands when it's hot, it contracts when it's cool, patterns that are bigger than the end part. So this is called shrink allowance, and this has to be accounted for when you're designing the pattern for that particular part. So different metals shrink at different rates, but something like an eighth inch per foot is pretty normal for most metals. So there's essentially two kinds of molds out there, expendable molds and non-expendable molds. An example of an expendable mold is sand casting, where you break the mold every time you produce a new part. So you have to pack the sand around the pattern, pull the pattern out, pour the molten metal, and you break the sand around the part to get to the finished product. Another kind of spindable mold casting is investment casting. This uses a ceramic slurry created around usually a wax pattern. The wax pattern is dipped in the ceramic slurry. It hardens, so think something like a, how they make candles. You dip it in there, it gets a coating on there. You have a piece of wax with a ceramic coating on it, and what's that good for, right? You take that ceramic with wax inside of it, you heat it up, the wax will come out of it, and now you have a mold cavity. These are this type of casting is very accurate. It's relatively cheap. It's used for a lot of high precision castings, especially exotic metals. So things like Inconel can be very successfully investment cast and without having to ever machine the part. Non-expendable molds are things like die casting where you have heavy duty metal die halves and you can put molten metal in there under high pressure, let it cure, the die halves open, you have an ejector that pops the thing out and you uh, close them, put more material in and it just keeps going. These aren't typically used for steel, so I won't talk about them too much out here, but the idea with any kind of casting, the way it works, the more money you spend up front, so something expensive like die casting with metal uh, reusable molds, be more expensive up front, but cheaper per unit because you don't have to make a new mold every single time. Whereas something like sand casting is very cheap up front. All you need is a way to melt metal and sand, but you got to make a new mold every single time. So you end up with more labor and you can't really automate it like you can something like die casting. Steel casts fairly well 
but it doesn't cast as good as cast iron as we talked about a minute ago. Operators have to really watch out to make sure that the steel pours at the correct temperature. So the moment the steel leaves that crucible to go into the mold, it's already cooling down. It's already starting to harden. So it has to be at the just right temperature as it pours. If it's under that temperature, it's gonna to start to solidify prematurely. So if you think about the steel going through the mold, if it starts to solidify, all the metal coming behind it is gonna have a tough path. So this is how you end up with molds that aren't full, cavities, uh, lapping, porosity, all sorts of issues. And the scary thing about castings so they're not always on the outside of the part. It could be internal defects that you're not gonna find unless you cut that thing in half to take a look. <coughs> Come on. So let's take a look at what happens when we cast metal. So at the top, I have a crucible that's being turned. It's got melted molten steel in it. At the bottom, I have the mold we're gonna pour it into. So this is in the shape of an ingot, just kind of a upside down triangle. The metal is gonna come out of here and say it's gonna fill up this mold. The next step, the only thing the metal can do, because the mold is essentially room temperature, the only thing the metal can do is solidify. So it's gonna cool down. So the question is, where does it start to cool down first? The answer is the outside. So these sides are cooler than the hot metal. So the grains are gonna form around the outside. Right, and the top, since it's room temperature as well. So we're gonna get little grains that start to form. So the faster the metal cools, the smaller the grains are. Now, it's gonna cool from the outside in. That heat is looking to escape. So in between the small grains near the edges and the inside, you're gonna get kind of elongated grains. Right. They're going to be following the path of heat out of the mold from the center. And in the very center, you're going to have what's called equiaxed grains. They're going to be basically a uniform size and shape, and they're going to be the largest grains because they took the largest time to cool down. So you're going to have different material properties from the outside in. Now, some kinds of cast iron use chilled plates around the outside to get very small grains on the outside of the part to give it more uh, abrasion resistance. You essentially have a harder, stronger metal on the outside and a kind of soft metal on the inside. But all castings are going to be like this unless they're manipulated. Um, there are continuous cooling castings for making things like turbine blades out of a single grain, but most commercial casting happens something like this. You're gonna have a mold, it's gonna fill up with metal, and it's gonna cool at a rate kind of like this. Now, imagine this mold is a different shape, right? It's a, like an L shape or something. It's still gonna follow these same rules. The outside will cool down first, the inside will cool down slower. So castings give you a, a pretty even material property through the material. The grains are typically equiaxed. You might have a little different material properties from the edge to the middle, but it's basically uniform throughout and uniform through the entire part. So casting is used usually when you need a complex shape that would be difficult to machine. They're not going to be as strong as the next thing we'll talk about, which are forged parts. Forging produces a more impact resistant part that's a little bit stronger than a cast part. One of the most common kinds of forging is known as hot forging. 
This is done when the metal is at an elevated temperature, somewhere around 2000 degrees. So the thing is glowing. If it's a big chunk of metal, it's bright orange. I mean, it's hot. This is done for a couple reasons. One, when metal is hot, it's a lot more ductile and easier to work. So if you try to forge something on a metal that's cold, you might need a 400 ton press to do it. If the metal's hot, you could probably use a 40 ton press. So it's a big difference in the equipment you need to accomplish it. Another, metal only has a certain amount of ductility when it's hot or cold. So say a metal has a elongation of 10% when it's cold, it might have an elongation of 100% when it's hot. This just means that when it's hot, you can squish it more. So you can get more work done in one single process without fracturing the metal. Hot forging creates a desirable grain pattern. So you're squishing the grains until they have a definite direction to them. They essentially make the part stronger in one direction than the other. But there's a ton of parts out there that are made this way. It's just a way to get more strength per weight. Whereas a casting might have less one strength, the exact same part, if it could be designed as a forging, would be stronger with the exact same amount of material. Now, forging is expensive. Typically for a closed die forging operation, you have to have dies that are stronger than whatever metal you're squishing with them, right? These dies are really, really expensive. You know, millions of dollars for the dies that make things like crankshafts and connecting rods out of steel. There's a couple different kinds of forging processes. There's drop forges where you have a giant hammer come smush the metal into a open or a closed die. There's ring rolling where you're just rolling the metal out into round shapes and upset forging, which is used to make things like screws and bolts very strong. You get that grain pattern built into the head of a heavy duty, say a hex screw by squishing the head down and making a desirable grain pattern. Forgings have higher impact strength and better toughness than a similarly sized cast part. Extrusions are just a form of forging in which you can make long, seamless shapes. So something like a railroad track is an extruded shape. You have a die, the shape of the part you want, and you essentially push the metal at a super high heat through it, basically like Play-Doh. And you can make long uh, shapes with a very uniform section and a very uniform grain structure because it's cooling down all at the same time, it's similar to a continuous casting. So there's seamless tubes, pipes, uh, shapes. So like C-channel is a hot extrusion. It's a lot easier to do it hot when the metal is very soft than it is to do a cold extrusion.